Father, there is information that wells up into us to growth, to sanctification, to a place that our mind and our hearts would change the way it thinks and acts. God, we want this information so that you are blessed by what we do. And we are blessed just to follow you. God, I personally, I speak for myself, I just surrender it all. I don't want any of my thoughts, hopes, dreams, desires. I don't want any of it, God. I only want yours because I believe that you have my best interest as we worship. I believe that what you have for me is better than what I have for me. Use your word today to lead and guide us, to break down any of my preconceived notions of who I think you are. Be who you are to me, and may I follow that, God, with all my strength. I ask this in your holy name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Verse 1 of chapter 7 of 2 Corinthians. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Give me your attention, please. This is what you call a boo-boo. Anybody know what a boo-boo is? It's when you make a mistake. Chapter 7, verse 1, and does not belong in chapter 7. It belongs in chapter 6. Did I just say the Bible has a mistake? No. I said that the chapter has a mistake. Do you guys know what happened in the 13th century? 1,300 years after the Lord Jesus died, some guy, anointed, I hope, by God, said, that book, that Bible, that's too difficult to read. I'm going to break it down into chapters. So for every book that's in there, it was now broken down into chapters. Chapter 1 of this, chapter 2 of this. That's in the 13th century. Well, it worked out so good in the 16th century, another guy comes along and goes, listen, I got a better idea. Let's break it down into verses. And they started writing little numbers in it. So when I say to you, turn to chapter 7, there was no chapter 7 a lot of years ago. What does that have to do with today's service? Listen, please understand this. The Bible calls the spirit of truth. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth, not the spirit of chapter and verse. We get so hung up on quoting Bible scripture. I remember being a, a young believer two, three years old. The first time I started, John 3.16. John, you'll, you'll even see tattoos that have verses on it. Listen, that's not the Bible. John 3.16 is not the Bible. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, who believed in Him, and not perish, have eternal life. That's the Bible. Not knowing where that occurs doesn't make you ungodly. Doesn't make you weird. The idea is to have it flowing through you. And you ready for this? You don't have to use the version of Bible that I have. You guys hear that I, when I, be ye not unequally yoked, be ye. Who speaks like that nowadays? Nobody. I do. You know why? Because I read this version. Well, what version do you read? Do you read the New King James? Praise God. Do you read the NASB? Praise God. Do you read the NEV? Praise God. As long as you are getting the truth in you. Calling out to God, telling God, according to your Bible, it says... I am prosperous in thee, if thou would. And thinking that you, God heard you specifically because you quoted the King James as if that's the way the Lord spoke. He didn't. The King James is King James. It's from England. He didn't speak like that. Our Lord Jesus, so you guys know, information, he spoke Hebrew, he spoke Greek, and he spoke Aramaic. He was multilingual. Good reason to be multilingual. However, quoting scripture exactly the way it occurs in the particular Bible you read does not make you closer to God. And it's very important to understand that. And you might ask me, do I have biblical basis for saying that? Absolutely. If you want to later on, you could turn, and this is just one of hundreds of places, you can look at uh, Hebrews chapter 1 where Paul, who wrote that, trying to explain to the 
Hebrews that the Lord Jesus was not an angel. He quotes like 10 different scriptures in that first chapter alone. And you know what you find out? He doesn't quote him exactly. And you think to yourself, man, did he make a mistake? It says he was anointed with the oil above all his fellows. But then you look at the psalm that he was quoting and it says about all his companions. Why did he do that? Because it wasn't the letter of the law that gave life. It was the spirit of the law that gave life. It was the truth that flows through you. It's the truth. You know, the Bible says, man, I don't know, it says, you know, it says something about believing in, in his son and then you go to heaven. But I don't remember the exact verse. You know, that's all you need to do. Some people, they don't want to go out street evangelizing. They don't want to witness. They don't want to share the love of Christ because they don't remember the exact chapter and verse. And, and you feel stupid, especially when you're talking to like a Jehovah Witness or a Mormon and they know their book, man, and they're going to quote their book. And you can look at them and go, man, you really know that book. You really know that. Yes, we do. It's the truth that lives in you. And it's the love of Christ that shall set others free from that. You guys understand that. Quick lesson. Each one of these books that is in this book, for you all that are new to Scripture, this Bible is 66 books written by about 40 different men. But people will always say, you see, I knew man wrote the Bible. No, these weren't just men. These were holy men. And there is a difference. Even the Bible recognizes that there is a difference. For the fervent, effectual prayer of a righteous man is powerful and availeth much. Who you want to pray for you? You want a guy who's living the life to pray for you? Well, I want a guy who lived the life. I want to read his words. I want a guy filled with the Holy Spirit. I don't want some guy that was demon-possessed. And if I get a little controversial right now, please forgive me. Do you know that the Koran, written by Muhammad, at one point in time, self-admittedly, was possessed by the devil himself? Written half of it during a possession of demons. He admits it himself freely. That's the word that you want to follow? Well, you have at it. Joseph Smith, who wrote the Book of Mormon, that's who you want? A man who said an angel came to him and spoke to him? Not me. I want the holy man anointed by the Holy Spirit who gave me 66 books. And then about 300 years after the Lord Jesus ascended, he had a group of men get together and choose the letters, which are called epistles, which you'll hear that word, the books, which we have, and he told them exactly which ones to put together. And they sealed what they call the final canon. Because my son, bless his heart, he does wrestling. And he loves to share the love of the Lord with these kids from public schools. And I cannot believe the arguments that they have, and I'm not talking about arguments, I'm, the, the, the banter that they have back and forth. This 17-year-old kid was texting back and forth with my son yesterday, and the things that he thought about the Bible. Well, you know, the prophecy in the Bible is inaccurate, and I can't believe because the Bible is written by men, and how do I know what God's will for my life is? And if it's not his will, then why does my heart want to do other things? And I thought to myself, doggone it, that's pretty deep thoughts for a 17-year-old kid. It's a shame they're foolish thoughts, though. It's a shame they're inaccurate thoughts. It's a shame that he's been watching Bill Maher on TV. It's a shame that he's been taught in school what not to believe before he even read it for himself to find out what he could believe. It's a shame that the enemy of God has gone before us and he's done reconnaissance work. He's gone out to where God's going to be and already set paths and traps and said, listen, tell all those folks before they even hear about the Lord Jesus, the Bible's not real. It's full of contradictions. You've heard that, haven't you? Before you even read it. You talk to somebody about the Bible, you know what you find out? Everybody thinks they're a Bible scholar. I'm at the gym, and I'm a purple belt. I've been studying jiu-jitsu about the last six years. Man, the white belts, the green belts, the blue, they're like this, man. They want to, well, how did you do that? How did you figure that out? And we teach them, right? You start talking about the Bible, everybody knows. Oh, I know the Bible. It's full of contradictions. Really? Which book? Uh, uh, Nehemiah, so somewhere. Adoniah? 
Did you ever read it? No, but I, I, I know it's full of contradictions. Why? Because men wrote it. No, holy men wrote it. What's the difference? Whew. All that to say, verse 2. Receive us. We have wronged no man. We have corrupted no man. We have defrauded no man. Paul now, starting in what should be verse 1 of chapter 7, but unfortunately is verse 2 of chapter 7, and I've already gone through that whole thing. Why? So come back. He starts to say, listen, Corinthian church, I want you to hear what I say. And one of the reasons I want you to hear what I say is because, you know why? Because I'm a holy man. That's how this connects. Yes, Paul was a holy man. A man filled with the spirit of the living God. A man who wrote half of the New Testament. A man who looked at the congregation of God and said this, I have wronged no man. That word for wrong, don't make fun of me. That word for wrong is to destroy, I'm sorry, is to hurt, damage, or injure. It's not just wrong. It's not like a personality because when you read the writings of Paul, you start to get a feel for his personality. He was kind of a pushy guy. Kind of a obnoxious, if you will. If you read the book of uh, Philemon and you see how he was really pushy with Philemon, you, mean, you can read that book and, and you go, man, I don't think I like this guy. He says, it doesn't matter whether you like me or not. Have I wronged you? Well, you know, you, you said this or you did that. No, no, no. I didn't ask you whether I said something you didn't like or whether I parked my car in a manner you didn't like. I mean, my chariot, whatever he was driving at the time. <laughs> Have I hurt, damaged, or injured anybody? No. Next he says, I have defrauded no man. Now some of you guys might be asking, why don't you just get glasses? I'm not gonna, that's why. Defrauded, the word for defrauded means, no, see, I need glasses. No man, we have corrupted no man. The word for corrupted is to covet, take advantage, make gain. Make gain. Nobody here has had their money robbed from some kind of plot. When you put your money in that tie box, it's not like we've invested it in gold and now gold's down a couple of bucks, so sorry. No, it hasn't happened. Paul was telling that to his church. He's saying you have not been wronged, corrupted, or defrauded, which means seduced, spiritually, destroyed, or spoiled. You get the point? Paul was saying you're safe around me. You get the point what he was saying, guys? Hello? Yes. Just checking. Thanks. <laughs> Paul was saying, I'm a holy man, and I got some stuff I want to tell you. Can you hear it? Can you handle it? Can you deal with it? Verse 3, I speak not this to condemn you, nor have I said, as I have said before, that ye are in our hearts to die and to live with you. Just trying to illustrate to them how much he loves them. Look, dude, you're in my heart. I couldn't love you anymore. Please hear what I'm about to tell you. Great is my boldness of speech towards you. Great is my glorying of you. I am filled with comfort. I'm exceedingly joyful in all our tribulation. This is like an introduction a preacher makes. He's laying something out. He's saying this clearly. I, sp I spoke boldly to you. I'm speaking plainly. I'm speaking in a way that nobody has. When you're going to a store and you buy something, the guy's going to say, hey, thank you very much. The lady's going to say, hey, thanks for coming to Publix. Goodbye. You know, you're not getting into... So tell me how you felt. How do you think? Nobody cares about that. Nobody cares about that. But Paul's saying, I care about that. I care about you. That's why I speak with boldness of speech. Could you imagine somebody talking to you outside these walls like I'm talking to you here? Why do I do it? Why did Paul do it? You know why? Because we really care about you. You'll see the depths of how we care about you. Because listen, there's a whole lot better things for me to be doing on a Sunday morning. Like sleeping. I lost an hour of sleep too last night. And I was up late last night with Kaz in Immokalee. Where is Immokalee? 
The better question is, when you've been there, what is a makali? <laughs> but I really, really love you guys. I really, really care about you guys. And I want to be ready to come here to speak boldly to you so that God can change your life somehow using my stupid lips with his beautiful word, the spirit of his word going forth from me, sounding like nothing else you've heard from anybody else because it's me speaking these words of truth. Verse 5, For when we come... When we were coming to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Outside were fightings, inside were fears. Here's the cool thing, guys. Again, I'm sorry. Back to me. He starts to tell them a story. It's kind of weird the way he does it. He starts to tell them this story about the things that were going on. He says, listen, I was in Macedonia. Macedonia was a crazy city. I get to Macedonia to start a church, and there's riots everywhere. And then what happened was we look outside, and we see riots and fights. And the inside, we were freaked out. We were like, oh, we didn't know what to do. But then, verse 6, Nevertheless, God that comforteth those that are cast down comforted us by the coming of Titus. Titus then comes to me. Now they hear Titus, they go, oh, we know Titus. He came and ministered with us for a while. Oh, we definitely know who Titus is. What did Titus say to you? Verse 7. And not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you when he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me so that I rejoice the more. Please, again, let me explain to you what's going on. Paul, about two years before this letter was written, he sent this other letter to the church in Corinth, and he gave them like the major smackdown. Stuff that you don't say to people outside. You know what I mean? Somebody cuts you off and they drive by in your car, you tell them they're number one, you hate on them, but it's over, right? You just got that one, did you? It's okay, take a while, it'll get there. Okay. He said, I had to say things I didn't want to say. It's not my nature to say. Paul, he felt so terrible that he, he, in 1 Corinthians, he told them, you're immature. Your church is immature. You act like fools. You accept people in your church who are sinning. I mean, if you guys read 1 Corinthians, if you take it piece by piece, you can get such good. But listen, you know the chapter that everybody quotes, love, love is patient, love is kind. You know what he was saying? You ain't! This is love. You ain't got love. Get a grip. But what happens is, Titus goes there a year later, after the letter was there. And do you know what happened? He said, Titus comes to me, and I was afraid he was going to say the church is falling apart. I mean, here's what happens as a pastor. Let me tell you what Paul's heart is, and you can only know this if you're a pastor. You go into your church, and you see people's lives are so messed up, Oh, my goodness. And you put the smack down on them, and then you leave and you go, well, they're messed up. Me and my wife used to do that. We used to meet with couples, and we had a rule, three and out. That was our three and out. We'd meet, get together with them and say, here's the problem with your marriage. You guys aren't praying together. Or here's the problem with your marriage. You're, you're not respecting. Here's the problem. You're not submitting. And then after three times, you go, I'm sorry, we don't meet anymore because you're not doing the things that we told you to do the first time we met. And then we'd leave. Bye. And they'd hate us. Oh, you can't meet with us. We need another counseling session. I'm sorry, we only do three. That's it. If you're not going to at least listen to the first three, what's the sense of meeting four, five, and six? I got things to do. And they include people who want to follow God's word. And we, we separate for them. Bye. See ya. And we see them a year later. And we say, so how's it going? Oh, things are so great. Oh. I thought things were going to fall apart in your life because you were so messed up. And now me and my wife are in counseling with you. Oh, well, you know, we stopped going to church for six months and things got so bad. But then we both came to this place and we fell down on our knees. <coughs> you guys get the point? Guess who they don't need? Me and my wife. Guess who they needed? The Lord Jesus. You got that? And here's what happened with Paul. He leaves the church thinking it's going to fall apart. He sees Titus and he thinks Titus and say, man, the church is a bloody mess. You won't believe what happened. The first thing that Titus says is, you won't believe what happened at that church. Earnest desire, mourning, fervent mind towards you. They love me? Yeah, they love me. But I said terrible things to them. I hurt them. 
You guys know what I'm talking about? When I read this, I was like, wow, I know exactly what you're talking about. Because I come up here and I say like the hardest things in the world. Some of you all come here thinking I'm going to be like Pastor Bob and I'm going to be real happy all the time. Speak real high. It's great. Everything's great. You know, Jesus loves you. And I don't. And I go, you're going to hell. If you don't repent, you're going to hell. You leave here, I hate that guy. And then God does something in your heart. It's amazing. God uses me. He uses Bob. And listen, I am not in that category of class. I'm just saying this just because some people come from there. That's King Daddy O to me. However, it's not us. We put out this word to you. God's truth in the spirit that he wants it to goes forward. And some, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Continue on. Watch. Verse 8, he says, for though I made you sorry with a letter, I don't repent, though I did repent. He says, I know I wrote this letter to you, and I busted you really good. I dropped a serious wood on you when I wrote that letter. I don't, I don't apologize for hurting your feelings, although at first I was really sorry I did. Paul's really de- Paul was like a woman. He's like super detailed. Super, super detailed. It drives me crazy. Because he's like, well, first I repent, then I didn't repent. But then I did repent, and then I... Dude, why don't you just say you didn't repent? Why did you say, well, I want them to know my heart in the matter. Well, you got that out, that's for sure. (laughs) For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent. Though I did repent, for I perceived that the same epistle had made you sorry, though it were for just a season. He says, I put the smack down on you. You hated my guts. You felt terrible. But it was only for a little while. But it was only for a season. Now, verse 9, I rejoice, not that you are made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance, for ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. Anybody spank their kid and have the kid cry and feel really bad that you made the kid cry, but you know you had to do it. That's what Paul's talking. Listen, for me as a pastor... It's even worse. Here's a verse. In, it's from the book of Proverbs. It says that um, he who rebukes finds more favor afterward than he who flatters with the tongue. You may come into my office. You may sit down and talk to me, and I may tell you something that you don't like. Dude, you're, you're out of it. You, you kidding me? You know you're playing a game. You, I'll say something like that, and you'll walk away, and you'll hate my guts. Especially the brothers. Now, non-believer, man, they receive everything. Yeah, thanks, man. See you later. Goodbye. You know, that's what they give you. Something like that. But the believers, you say something to them that they don't like, and they get very offended. And then they leave, and then the Spirit begins to work on their heart, work on their heart. And then a year later, six months later, sometimes a couple years later, you see them and you're like, dude, I just... Thanks for telling me the truth when nobody else would. Man, that's what I do. And it's happened so many times in the 20 years I'm in ministry now, I don't think twice about it. My wife goes, you are too harsh. You hurt those people. I felt sorry, but then I didn't feel sorry. (laughs) I felt sorry, but now I don't feel sorry. See, my wife says, that's terrible. Don't you have any compassion? I almost did for a second, but it... <laughs> Why? I want you to go to heaven. And as much as I want you to go to heaven, I want you to be... You ready? What's the word? I lost it. Never mind. It's gone. <laughs> Sanctified. That's the word. I found it again. I want your sanctification. I don't want you to just go to heaven. I want you to be blessed on earth. I want you to have what me and my wife have. Yes, There's hassles, there's fighting, there's arguments, there's turmoil. But when I look into my wife's eyes, I am enraptured all over again. I don't want you to sit in my office and go, we're not in love anymore, but we love each other. Like, "Ah!" what the heck is that supposed to mean? Well, I fell in love. I don't even want to go there. I'll say something really bad. Verse 10. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Guys, here's the sad part. Oh, this is so sad. Godly sorrow worketh repentance. 
when I say something to you of the Word of God in the power of the Holy Spirit that hurts you, it breaks you. And if the Holy Spirit is working on you, that pain turns into a drive and a determination for better and more. If the Holy Spirit is working on you, you might walk away going, I don't like what that dude said, but there's something inside of you at the bottom of your spirit that you know it's what you're supposed to do, and you come back when you're ready. However, if the Holy Spirit isn't working on you, let me tell you what it is. It's called worldly sorrow. I don't like what you said, and I hate you, and you will pay for it. It's the same thing, the question I always get, get asked about the Bible, how come Judas didn't get saved if the Bible says he was sorry about what he did? The Bible says that Judas was sorry. For you all that are new to Scripture, there's a man in the Scripture named Judas. He is the one that sold Jesus out. He was one of his 12 best friends, and he sold Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. The Bible says that he was sorry that he had done it. How come he wasn't forgiven? Because he wasn't sorry. He wasn't sorrowed or sorry in a godly manner. He was sorry he got caught. You ever catch your son doing something he shouldn't? And you go, I'm sorry. You're not sorry. You're sorry you got caught. This sorry is only going to make you smarter not to get caught next time, isn't it? So you have no intention of not doing it again, do you? Didn't I tell you not to stay up all night and play on that phone, girl? Didn't I tell you not to stay up all night and play on that computer, son? Are you sorry? Are you going to do it again tomorrow? You're lying now, aren't you? <laughs> Parents know what I'm talking about, don't you? Kids are like, you're ratting me out. Yeah, and that's funny because we're talking about kids, but let me tell you, in ministry, as long as I have, and you meet a man or a woman, and you tell them the truth, and, and here's the thing, they've been walking around as a believer for five or ten years, and you see the sin of their life start to come to the top, and you look at them and you tell them, listen, here's what you've done, and they want to repent, but they cannot because it's not there. Do you have any idea? I know pastors, and I swear, they, they, there's no way they could be saved. They're pastors, and you confront them on their sin, and they will not repent, and they won't do it, and they will do the sin again. And it's like, dude, why don't you get it? Me and Dustin, we know this guy from New York. He's in a church, and, he, and he's a pastor, and he sleeps with one of the women of his church. You want to hear worse? Listen to me. Listen, it's worse. His son was dying, what was it, from liver, kidney? This son, this guy's son, was dying of a, a kidney disease. This man in his congregation donated his kidney to his son. The pastor then repaid him by sleeping with his wife. Then he came back to the church a few months later and did it again. But he was sorry. But he was sorry. Now, am I telling you this just so you can say, man, I can't believe pastors would do it? No, here's what I'm telling you. Check yourself. Your heart gets harder and harder. The Bible says that at one point in time, your heart is seared. You know what searing is? In the old days, if you had an injury and it was bleeding, they used to take a hot iron and used to burn it to close the injury. That's what you do to your heart. If you let your sin go unchecked, if you don't repent, if, you, if, I, if I'm up here and I tell you, listen, if you don't repent of your sins, you're going to hell. Man, whatever, 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 whatever. Don't let it go. It was, um, it was Apollo Creed in Rocky III that said it best. There is no tomorrow. There is no tomorrow. It's not guaranteed. When I'm telling you these things, Paul is saying, thank God for you church in Corinth, you repented, but there is a repentance that leads to death. It's the sorry you... you. Another story in the Bible. It's uh, two brothers, Esau 
You guys know the story of Esau and Jacob? Esau sold his birthright. Esau was the child of promise, the firstborn. He was to get the kingdom. And he didn't care about it, so he gave it to his brother for a, a pottage of stew, a bowl of soup. Then later on, he was sorry that he did it. I'm sorry. I want my birthright. Where's my blessing? It's like, dude, you sold it for a pot. You sold it for your belly. And he cried and screamed, but he sought no, he found no place for repentance of his heart. Listen to me. If you don't repent, you might not get a second chance. Does that sound unforgiving, unloving? You might not hear that. You might leave and not come back. You might hate my guts. Please, hate my guts, but don't hate God. There are... Listen... Anybody that's been involved in a church that has had that happen, and we're gonna, let's not make believe it doesn't happen. Some of my good friends have done abominable things after preaching a message from God, sitting up here and preaching a message of God, all the while they're sleeping with some woman that is not their own in the church. This happens. Be careful. The Bible says in, I think it's Proverbs chapter 7, that these men that get taken down by a harlot, they're strong men. Strong, even the best of men get taken out. Find the repentance while it's there, while the voice of God is loud, while the, while, while the conviction is clear. Repent and give it up, ladies or men. Continuing on. Verse 11, for behold, this selfsame thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you. Listen to me, this is great. I'll read it all the way through, but here's what he says. You know what your sorrow produced? I'm telling you, this is what godly sorrow produces. When it's the Lord, here's what it produces. You ready? Verse 11 again, for this selfsame thing, speaking of godly sorrow that ye sorrowed, what carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what vengeance or vindication. In all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. You have approved yourself to be clear in this matter. Here's what he said. I told you what you did wrong, and it produced a hunger, a drive in you that was evident. Let me tell you what happened in the Corinthian church. There was a man that came into the church, walking in the church, arm in arm, with his father's wife, his stepmom. And you all were so tolerant. Oh, that's nice. No, no, no. Don't judge. Don't judge. There he was. The man was sleeping with his father's wife. And in the name of tolerance, they said, oh, don't judge. You can't judge, you know. That's going to be legal in all these states now. And he wrote them and he goes, you know what you need to do to that guy? You need to deliver him up to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. You need to throw him out of your church. And he didn't know what their response was. We have the benefit. He just sent the letter off. But you know what the benefit was to him doing that? This godly repentance. He said, you guys did it right. You did it right. And you know what we found out a chapter ago, or two chapters ago, that not only did they do it right so that they were cleared of the situation, but that the man himself repented and was restored back to the church. When you do things the right way, and you don't worry about hurting somebody's feelings. You hurt my feelings. You hurt my feelings. Nobody cares about your feelings. I care about your salvation. I care about your sanctification. Let your mommy care for your feelings, okay? Did that sound mean? I ain't kidding either. I don't care about your feelings. I care about the fate of your life. And when I sit up here and I preach these things to you, sit there. And be convicted, man, and change. Listen to what godly conviction produces. It doesn't produce, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, and then a month later, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, and then a month later, I'm sorry. It doesn't produce that. It produces mm, clearing. I've got to make changes in my life. 
Why? Because I'm going to go to hell if I don't. Do you understand? It's got to drive you. Verse 11 again. What carefulness it wrought in you. He, they were careful not to do it again. What clearing of yourselves. We got to make this right. What indignation they were mad. Our Lord Jesus said, Blessed is he who mourns, for he shall be comforted. That's not just everybody who cries. It's when you mourn your own sad state. It's when you go home like I go home every single night. And on my way home in my truck, all of a sudden the Spirit comes upon me again because I start praying and I go, Dude, what did you do today? I did it again. I, and I go through my list of sins that are between me and God, not between you and him. And I go, God, would you forgive me again? And God goes, absolutely. Why do I keep acting like this, God? Why is it, shouldn't I be over this? And God says, yeah, you should. But I love the heart of repentance you have, so I'm going to forgive you again. But today, today was bad, God. Yeah, I know. That's why my son died. For your sin. God, aren't you ever sick of me? Never. Aren't you tired of hearing me say I'm sorry, but yet going back to my sin? I wish you would overcome your sin, and I want to give you strength to do that. Well, where, where do I get that strength, God? It's in the Word. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. What do I got to do to get stronger? Well, Son, my word says, do not forsake the gathering of the brethren. Get in church every time the doors are open. Okay, I'm going to do that. My word says to sing songs and melody, making melody in your heart to the Lord, speaking these things. So fill your heart with worship music, not that junk that you listen to on the radio. And I turn off the radio. What else, God? Well, you see, the Bible says it's the word of life. Fill your life with the word every day, God. Anything else? Lots. <laughs> Let's get to that another time. <laughs> this sounds like a lot of work, this life, doesn't it? it? Sounds like a lot of work. You know, I was talking to Danielle before the service, and I was asking her. She's a, a blessed sister who's looking to spend the rest of her life doing ministry. And I said, tell me what your plan, what, what God wants to do in your life. Because I, I love to hear this Young sisters like her, how old are you? 19. They're like this, you ever see a closed rose? And they're, they're, just, about, they're just about to bust open. She's, she's, I use this word, please, nobody, she's pregnant with the plan of God. Amen. She's pregnant with the plan, and, and it's, just, it's just about to explode. Tell me what you want God to do in your life? And she's like, ah, I don't know what you mean. And I said, well, what if I told you what my ideal, my, here's my perfect life, to have a woman that you're absolutely enraptured with, to have kids whom you adore, to have jujitsu that you can practice all the time, to have a church of people who love the Lord, to have a business that that pays you so you don't have to hardly take much money from the church. That's my ideal life. And I, I forget who it was. It was Bill who goes, that's what your life is. And I go, I got the greatest life in the world. God has done me so well. So in this hard life of seeking his word, of, of losing sleep every single morning, where I could be sleeping till 8, 8.30 and still get to work plenty on time, I'm getting up at 6.37. I'm getting in prayer and getting in the Word. Why? Why? Because I don't like to sleep? No, I really like to sleep. You know why? Listen what God has done with my life. All I had to do was surrender, and all I had to do was ask Him for forgiveness. All I had to do was lay my life down and do whatever was in my power to do. And He says, listen, what you began in the flesh, I'll make it perfect in the Spirit. And He's given me everything I've ever dreamed now I'm going to continue to keep those things strong because the, te the story isn't over. I, my story can be that same story as the guy I was telling you about. So every day I continue. God, don't take away the plan. Look, I'm in the Word. I'm in the Word. Give me strength. Give me strength. Give me strength. Every day seeking the Word for strength. Every day seeking the Spirit for strength. Every single day. Because you know why? 
yeah, this life's hard. And there's a lot of commandments. As men, we don't like commandments. I don't like when people tell me what to do. Don't tell me what to do. God told you what to do, then I'm going to do it. God tells me what to do, I'm going to do it. Everybody else, they might have a second guess there, but God tells me what to do, I'm doing it. Continuing, sorry. Verse 12. Wherefore, though I wrote unto you, I did not do it for the cause that had done the wrong, nor for the cause that suffered wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear unto you. He goes, listen, you think I'm telling you what to do for me? You think I'm telling you what to do because of them? You think I'm telling you what to do? I'm telling you what to do because of you. We do that. God says, hey, guys, if you have a girlfriend that's not your wife, don't sleep with her. God doesn't want me to have fun. No, he knows what it's going to do to you later on because you come in my office after you get serious about things and go, I don't know if she's the one. Of course you know if she's the one. You've already had sex with her. Of course you're not going to know. So what should I do? Should I just marry her because now she's pregnant? Well, no. You mean I shouldn't marry her if she's pregnant? That's right, you shouldn't. Well, when should I marry her? When God says to marry her. When does God say, you'd know that had you not slept with her from the beginning? Do you understand that? He tells you not to do something because he knows what is going to happen in your life later on. And his best interest for you is you. We always think that, and this is exactly what Paul said. That's the heart of a shepherd. Dude, I didn't tell you to do that to spoil your fun. I didn't tell you not to do that because of anything else, except I knew what was best for you. That's a hard thing, man. That's tough. Because it feels so good. Verse 13. Therefore we were comforted in your comfort, yea, and exceedingly the more joyed we for the joy of Titus, because his spirit was refreshed by you all. And then finishing up, he says, man, all of the things that Titus told me about your church just blew me away. All the things that Titus told me about what was going on, I felt so bad because, man, I put the smack down on you guys. You guys were all upset. I was so, I'm so glad now. I'm so happy now. I'm so blessed that Titus brought to me this good report. Verse 14, for, I, if I have, for if I have boasted anything to him of you, I'm not ashamed. But as we spake all things to you in truth, even so our boasting, which I made before Titus, is found a truth. He goes, I bragged about you. That's right. I bragged. And let me tell you how it works for me as a pastor. People ask me about my church. And it depends what position they come from before this. If they go to a giant church, the first thing is, how many people you got in your church? And I go, every one of them. <laughs> because people in this country especially, they judge everything by how many people you got in this church. But I brag. But I brag to other pastors and I talk. I said, let me tell you about my church. We have the highest ratio of foster parents per number of people in church. What does that mean? So there's more people. The average number of people doing foster care in churches is like 2 to 3%. Ours is like over 10%. So for me, it could be like this prideful thing. Well, you're being very prideful about your church. And this is exactly what he was talking about. He says, yeah, yeah, I was a little prideful about you guys because I was bragging on you. I'm bragging. I'm not bragging about me. I'm bragging about you. Yeah, it's not me. It's God's word. You know why? Because I just put the spirit of the word out there. It has very little to do with me. It's just the fact that I will not subject you guys to anything but the pure spirit of God's word. The truth of the word going forward in a manner that is without apology. And whatever it rots in you, whether it makes you leave and not come back, whether it makes others leave, I can't be worried about all that stuff. I have to only do this so that God gets whatever he wants out of you. Hey, listen, foster care is not for everybody. MMA is not for everybody. Serving at the convalescent home is not for everybody. Doing child care is not for everybody. But we're saying, I know there's people here that want to, that don't. There's ministries to be done. I know there's people here that are called to, but they're not because of their mental state. Paul is preaching this powerhouse of a word, unlocking in them. Come on! You guys got it. Lastly, verse 15. 
and his inward affection is more abundant toward you, whilst he remembereth the obedience of you all, how with fear and trembling ye received him. I rejoice, therefore, that I have confidence in you in all things. Close your Bible. Last thought. He says to them, he goes, when Titus got there, he didn't know what to expect. Because here I write down this, I write this smack down letter, I send it to you guys, and Titus is afraid, oh, you come from Paul? Good, then we're going to kill you like we wanted to kill him when he was here. Titus didn't know, so he walks in, he walks into the church, and he's like, hi, I'm Titus, I come from, uh, you know, the Apostle Paul. And he's like, and he's like, all right, are they picking up rocks yet? As soon as they saw him, they were like, bro, thank God you're here, we want to tell you. And now they start repenting, rejoicing, and they lift him up, and they he's like, yes. And then a year later, he goes and sees Paul. And he says, Paul, let me tell you what's going on in the church in Corinth. Your letter. And Paul starts to hear it. And he's lifted. Yes, that's what I wanted. He's so blessed by them. He's so blessed by what happened. And he tells Titus, I told you about those people. I told you about them. That's how I am about you guys. That's how you should be about others that are in your life. Not just getting along to get along, going along to get along. Does anybody have any questions about this Bible study? Anything anybody confused on? You know, I wanted, you said something there, I just wanted to clarify. You could ask me afterward if you're embarrassed. Let's pray, let's close. Um, afterward, please, pastors, elders, deacons, come up here and, and just be prayer partners available. Uh, let's close in prayer. Father, thank you so much that your word is so good. Thank you so much, God, that your spirit is so faithful. And thank you, God, for the obedience of your son to come and, and die for us who do not deserve it. And Father, forgive me if, if I have made your word confusing to anybody at all God, I know this is such a hard subject to understand the difference between worldly repentance and, and godly repentance, worldly sorrow and godly repentance. God, if, there's be one, if there is one person here who does not know you, that's never gave themselves fully to you, hey, I'm... Um, I think that there's one or more people here that want to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. And the way that you do that is just by opening your heart and letting him inside. The things that we talked about today, if it created a burning in your, uh, in your spirit. It's just a matter of telling God, I need you and I want you. Help me to love you. It's very, very hard to love what you can't see. Very, very hard. It's, it's, it's something that takes time. Just let God, who has done this work, it was not my persuasive words, believe me, that burnt in your heart today. It was the power of the Holy Spirit who is at this church. And if you are here and... I'm trying to find out how God would want to handle this best. I'm trying to be in prayer. Um, Hey, if you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, just stand to your feet right now and we will lead you in a prayer that will help you. If you want to do that, just stand up. Anybody that wants to just accept Jesus Christ as their Savior, if there's nobody, it's fine. If there's everybody, don't, don't feel. I just, just don't want anybody to leave here without being sure. I just, I, guys, please give me all your attentions, please. I just have this feeling, this sense, that there is a, there is a, a tragedy to be befall and I don't want anybody to leave here without knowing that they know that they know that they know they've made their business straight with God. This is not a persuasion. You guys that don't know me, I don't do this often. 
I just want to make sure if there is anybody here that is unsure in any way, shape, or form, it is a very simple thing. Romans chapter 10 and verse 9 says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That word saved in the Greek is sozo, which means released from the power of hell, given to heaven. You will be given to heaven. If anybody is here that wants to accept, stand up. We will lead you in this prayer. Do not be afraid or shy. Christians, pray. Don't leave here without knowing. Also understand, guys, that in your quiet time alone with God, whether it's on your way home, whether it is, I know there's something here. I know there's something more going on here. We're going to let the prayer counselors take care of it. I'm going to close in prayer now. Prayer counselors, come up now, please. I'm going to close in prayer so that that way nobody just leaves with the crowd. There's something going on in here that needs to be undone. I, I'm sorry, guys. I don't want to sound weird, but I know that somebody's got to take care of business with God today. That's not been. So come on up and just uh, get that prayer. Let me close in prayer. Guys, stand up, please. Let's leave in a celebratory attitude. And if you want to just come and make your business done with God today. Father, I thank you so much for today's word, today's message. God, bless each and every person that's here. May they be the head and not the tail. May they be the front and never behind. May they go in, in the peace of God, which surpasses understanding. We love you and thank you. 